Hello everyone. I am Sunil Kenchanmane Raju, a postdoc in Department of Plant Biology, Michigan State University. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the Life Science Discussion Forum, Botany for You, for giving me an opportunity to talk about my research. This is a wonderful initiative by the Botany for You, and I hope all the students can take advantage of this um, amazing initiative. I want to extend my thanks to Nishikant, who uh, invited me to give a talk in this forum. Uh, Nishiji asked me to talk about the basics of plant epigenetics and comparative epigenomics, rather than going into details about my own research from PhD and my postdoc. So I'll try to give a brief uh, introduction about the current trends in plant epigenetics and comparative epigenomics starting from plant domestication and also how genetics has played an important role in plant improvement and how epigenetics can also add uh, towards crop improvement programs. Uh, I also wanted to just plug in about my own organization, Plant Postdocs. It's an organization for postdocs who are working in plant related fields who are looking for jobs in academia or industry. So if you are a postdoc working in plant biology, uh, please check out our website, www.plantpostdocs.com. Uh, let me go ahead and turn off my video uh, so that there is good bandwidth for my uh, presentation. Okay, so before jumping into epigenetics or comparative epigenomics, I want to start with domestication and about uh, genetics. So most of you have seen this plant. Uh, uh, it's one of the most efficient crop plants on earth, which can uh, utilize solar energy and produce a lot of food. So one of the most efficient systems there is on the planet is this maize plant. Uh, and I was just checking some facts. Karnataka is the number one pro producer of maize in India. I'm from Karnataka. Uh, and also um, I was checking other states, Maharashtra I think is in number five. It just states that uh, corn is such an important crop, uh, economic crop for Indian farmers. But one thing to wonder is where did this crop come from? Was it originally from uh, the place that we are growing it now? Actually it turns out corn was domesticated in Mexico. So if you see how this plant looked like, uh, 10,000 years ago, it didn't look anything similar to the current corn plants. Um, uh, uh, maize is called corn in North America, so I'll be switching between maize and corn. So, so Teosinte is considered as the ancestor of maize, and Teosinte was growing in um, southwest Mexico, and from there, farmers domesticated this plant to a modern uh, maize uh, plant that we see in the uh, in the production of maize uh, kernels. So as you can see, it has many branches, uh, and also the seeds are seeds look completely different from uh, the current uh, maize corn cobs. So 10,000 years ago, farmers in Mexico selected this plant, uh, and and select the selection and domestication helped it become to a plant that looks like this. So as you can see from producing 10 to 15 uh, kernels, uh, the maize is producing up to 500 kernels in a cob in a modern, uh, modern variety of corn that is produced in North America. So domestication has helped in the production of very highly efficient uh, uh, crop plant coming from a plant that looked like a bush with multiple branches. So, so this is how it looked like 10,000 years ago in Mexico. It didn't look anything like modern corn. So how does domestication work? So there are multiple important domestication traits that the farmers uh, at that time uh, used to select plants that we are currently consuming in the modern world. So for example, if you see uh, farmers looked for the uh, fruits that did not fall on the ground, they wanted fruits to stay on the plant so that they can go and pick it easily. So that's one of the traits that they considered when they were domesticating plants. 
The other one is, of course, looking for bigger fruits. For example, tomato, if you see the ancestor of tomato, the, the, the fruit was of the size of a small grape. But then domestication and breeding helped uh, make the tomato fruit bigger. And that's what we are using in the modern production for tomato. And there are multiple other agronomic traits that were selected. For example, uh, day length dependence, determinate growth. And also one of the important consumer trait is the color variation of the fruit or the seeds. So that's one of the important considerations uh, was, that was used for plant domestication. Other traits like vernalization requirement. But as you can see for cereal crops and grain crops, one of the major uh, traits that the farmers at that time selected was increase in seed number. Uh, so you wanted plants that produced more seeds that you can see from uh, when teosinte was domesticated into corn, uh, teosinte that was producing up to 15 kernels per stem now produces up to 500 seeds per plant. So that's a big increase in seed number, one of the important domestication traits. The other domestication traits, as you can imagine, is reduction in the seed shattering. Even teosinte uh, produces, uh, the seeds of teosinte shatter, and then if you are a farmer producing teosinte, you have to always go and check on the seeds so that it doesn't fall down to the ground. But maize, as you can see, doesn't shatter its uh, kernels. So that's one of the traits that was used for domestication reduction in seed shattering. And I, I assume that most of you know that height is one of the important traits. So height was one of the important traits that was selected uh, during green revolution in wheat and rice. So a very tall plant, when it produces a lot of seeds, uh, falls down to the ground and we lose the seeds. So if a plant is shorter, then the number of uh, then the plants that fall down will be reduced and that is how uh, green revolution helped in producing higher yielding wheat and rice varieties that were shorter and did not lodge so that's that's how green revolution increased production of wheat and rice in india and other asian countries and also reduced dormancy is another uh, trait that's very important for domestication so these traits are all important and they are all remarkable traits that the humans selected uh, during domestication. So if you go back to the example of maize, as I was telling you, this is the uh, teosinte kernel. So these seeds have very hard seed shell and it's very difficult to open the seeds for uh, human consumption. So what is happening here is if you see the change of a teosinte into a plant, into a uh, uh, into a cob that looks very similar to modern maize, there's very few genes that are changed. So if you change these three genes, uh, teosinte branched one, uh, teosinte uh, gloom architecture one, and an answer of teosinte branched one. So if you change these three genes in teosinte, you can flip the uh, teosinte cob inside out so that the hard gloom part goes inside. So basically this inside part is what was outside in the teosinte. So these three gene changes can make uh, teosinte back into something very similar to what a modern uh, corn looks like. So what these suggest is that very few changes, very few changes in genes can lead to domestication. Um, so if you think about how these mutations help, if you have a mutation, this creates variation, and then some of the unfavorable mutations, those are selected against, but favorable mutations uh, are reproduced and they are more likely to survive and reproduce and increase their frequency in the population. So if you take an example uh, of a field that is growing a lot of sorghum plants, uh, if you, you can see here that one of the plant looks different. Actually, this one is an example of a reversion of DW3, but uh, if it's an important trait that is required, then farmers can select this plant, use these seeds and then grow more and then see why this plant is better than the other plants. Similarly, if you think about uh, disease resistance, this is an example from a chickpea plant with root rot disease. The plants which are brown are dying because of the root rot disease. So if you can imagine a field which is devastated by this root rot disease, 
you can have some plants which are resistant to this uh, disease. So these plants, if you collect the seeds from these plants, they will have a genetic change that allows them to be resistant to whatever disease that killed this whole plot. So this is how breeders, this is how breeders are using uh, genetic variation uh, in, under, in using it for crop improvement, uh, crop improvement programs. So, so how, how do breeders do this, right? So what happens is if you imagine a field with uh, corn plants, uniform field, so and then only one of the plant, uh, which, is, which is called a mutant, shows a different trait. So in, in this case, it's a dark green leaves here. So what breeders do is they want to exploit this genetic variation. So to, to do that, they first check whether this mutant is true breeding. That means is if you take a seed from this plant, do you see all the progeny show, the, show similar phenotypes? And if that is true, then you can go ahead and cross it with a wild type plant. A wild type plant is a, a, a regular plant. As you can see here, this is the plant that we started with. So when you cross these two back and in the F1, the, both the chromosomes of, uh, one chromosome from the mutant and one chromosome from the wild type plant is in the F1. So when you go to the F2, you see segregation for this trait. As you can see here, some of the plants in the F2 generation show the trait of one of the parent and most other plants show the trait for the wild type plants. So here you can do two things. One, you can go back and sequence all the plants that show the uh, phenotype of the mutant as well as um, uh, phenotype some of the plants that look like wild type and see what is the genetic change that is causing this phenotype. So this way you can get uh, into the understanding of the gene function using uh, these gene mutations. The other way to do is you follow these plants and then see if they also breed true. That means you take seeds from these plants and then see if they segregate or if they show similar phenotype. And this is, if this is an agronomically important trait, then you can continue breeding that plant. So most of the time what happens is the, these plants, the wild type plants have all the desirable traits, but then only one of the traits, for example, this dark green color might be more beneficial. So you want to add only this trait along with all the good traits from this wild type plant. So for that, you need to use recombination. So you create a large F2 population and then you make sure that along with this good trait of uh, dark green leaves, if there is any other trait that is unfavorable trait that is coming along with this plant, you can remove that using recombination. So you grow a large number of plants and you select plants that only have the advantageous green um, trait from these mutants, as well as all the important traits that the wild type plants already have. So then you create a new plant which has all the traits plus a new trait that is beneficial. So this is how uh, breeders are utilizing genetic variation. So there are three ways, uh, three broad ways how you can use genetic variation. One is the using naturally available genetic variation. So you have a field or you have a wild site where, you're, where your plant is growing and you see a mutant plant that shows a desired character. So you take that plant and breed that plant or you use that to understand the function of the gene that is being changed to give this trait. So that is using natural uh, variation for crop improvement. The other way to do is take seeds from one of the plant, one of the wild type plants, and then use chemical or physical treatments uh, to induce mutations. So you can use chemicals like EMS or you can use radiations. So both of these, go and change the DNA sequence within these seeds. So then if you grow them out, so when you treat the uh, seeds, it's called the M0 generation, and then you go and grow them out from the seed. Uh, and in this case, you usually do not see much phenotypes because uh, the, the, the mutation that you do will be heterozygous here. So only dominant traits will be seen here and recessive traits will not be visible. So when you go to M2 generation, you see some plants which show a different phenotype than the selection of the 
see the selection of the plants you had before as wild type. So then you can select this plant. You can either sequence the plant and see what is going on, or you can follow up and then see if this trait is uh, breeding true with further generations. So this is called mutation breeding. So you can use either chemical mutagens or physical treatment to induce uh, genetic mutations and then follow them up. Uh, and then use there are multiple uh, ways to test and see which gene is affected and how it functions in giving these traits. I will not go into those details, but this is how mutation breeding works. And the third and the most used uh, nowadays is using genome editing or basically using transformation. So you can use any uh, plant species that is amenable to transformation. And then you can use CRISPR-Cas9, which is the uh, most, um, uh, most widely used method now. And then you can induce a change in the gene um, and then have genetic variation come from uh, the transformation. So what you're basically doing is there are two, uh, um, two broad uh, generalizations here. One is that you can have a cisgenic from a transformation. For example, you can take this plant, uh, which is, for example, if this is a corn plant, you take this plant and then use CRISPR-Cas9 to go in and mutate a gene that is already present in this plant. So by mutating that gene, you're creating a new function for that gene. Either the, the function of that gene is, uh, it's no longer working now, so it's a knockout of that gene, or you are changing the expression of that gene so that the gene does a little different from what it used to do before. So that is called cisgenics because you're not introducing a gene from outside source. You're just manipulating the gene within this, uh, within this plant. You can also take genes from uh, other plant species, clone them into bacteria, and then also transform them back into this plant and have that gene express a protein and give a phenotype which is different from all the other plants. So that is called transgenics. You can either use a gene from a different plant or you can use genes from uh, bacteria. One of the examples is the Bacillus thuringiensis that is used uh, in, in Bt cotton. So you can either use transgenics or cisgenics to edit the genome and editing a genome also creates extra variation that the plant breeders uh, can use uh, in crop improvement programs. So these are the ways that the breeders are using uh, variation for crop improvement. But th there are a lot of limitations and bottlenecks. So, so one of the things is by through domestication and plant breeding, we are depleting genetic variation from critical uh, uh, from our important crops. So this is, is um, affecting how the crops can uh, adapt to stress and climate changes. So here again, going back to the maize example. So if you imagine teosintes having different genes, uh, different color, mean different genes here. So when I talk about a neutral gene, that means it's the repertoire of all the genes that is present in the genome. So Teosinte, for example, had these many genes and through domestication, you're only uh, taking some genes in the land races. By land races, it's usually the wild varieties that the farmers use and not the commercial uh, modern uh, cultivars that are used for um, agriculture. So from land races, when you're going from land races, but through plant breeding into modern inbreds, you can see that you have lost some of the genes that is present in Teosinte as well as the land races. So what happens is in domestication genes, so if this is a favorable domestication gene, then through domestication, you are only following that gene. And then in the modern inbreds, that gene is in higher frequency compared to all other genes. So one of the, uh, the examples in Teosinte is the uh, Teosinte branched one gene, for example, that was targeted. So then maybe these modern inbreds have higher uh, uh, frequency of that particular allele or that particular gene. Similar with improvement genes. So if you, if you select for certain genes to be present in your modern cultivars uh, through uh, domestication or through blend breeding, you have only these genes. So now what happens is when you try to use this modern inbred plant, 
uh, for stress adaptation to environments that they were never growing in. So then you have a problem because this has limited genetic variation and you cannot work much with a limited genetic variation. So you have to go back to um, your uh, um, uh, uh, Tiosinte or you have to go back to land races to find these uh, genetic variation. So currently uh, to address this uh, stress adaptation and climate change, we need new ways where we can exploit more variation uh, in the modern inbred lines than what is present in the in the genetic variation that we see here. So one of the things we can do is use epigenetics for this. The reason is that, as you can see here, um, maize was domesticated here in Mexico, but most of the maize is now grown in North America here, as well as Brazil and Argentina. If you see cotton, cotton was domesticated here, but cotton is grown uh, in US as well as in other places. So uh, crops uh, are being grown in areas that are different from their center of origin and primary geographic distribution. So then they have to cope with different stress and these need a, uh, big resources for genetic variation to help plant breeders to breed the plants into their new environment. So here I'm just showing uh, a graph that shows how photosynthesis is going on from February to December in North America. So if you can see here in Central America during August, there's a lot of maize plants growing and they're photosynthesizing heavily. Uh, so you can see that this region is different from the region of origin of maize. So they have to adapt to this new condition and grow there. So they need a lot of genetic variation that can help them to be able to adapt to this condition. So epigenetics is one of the ways through which we can incorporate this new uh, variation. So if you think about epigenetic variation, so epigenetic variation is useful in crop improvement. And this is an example of different epigenetic marks on, in, in plants. So the first, you can see here, that these are the histone marks. I will not be talking much about the histone marks. Histone marks are very dynamic. Uh, they are more dynamic than DNA methylation marks. So we'll be focusing more on DNA methylation here. So DNA methylation can happen in three different contexts uh, on the nucleotides uh, of the DNA sequence. One is the CG methylated site, the CHG methylated site, and the CHH methylation site. So H here means it can be A, uh, uh, C, or a T and not a G. So you can see here, so the DNA methylation can happen on the gene body. And most of the time in plants, this happens only in the CG context shown here in red and also on the transposons. So transposons are the transposable elements that keep jumping uh, across the genome and they can affect the expression of a gene uh, that, uh, that is next to it. Or if it jumps on, on a gene, it disrupts the function of the gene. And as you can see here, transposons can be methylated in all three contexts, the CG, CHG, as well as CHH context. And there are multiple mechanisms to demethylate the regions and remove the methylation mark. Uh, and also on the transposon, there is a very defined mechanism called de novo DNA methylation that involves the RNA directed DNA methylation pathway to reinforce methylation on the transposon and suppress the expression of the transposon. So uh, before going into much details of DNA methylation, I want to tell you what uh, DNA methylation definition means. So different people uh, use DNA epigenetics in a different way. So literally epigenetics means uh, on top of genetics. Uh, so this is usually the information that is coded beyond the DNA sequence information. So it can be covalent modification of the DNA uh, cytosine DNA methylation that I talked about before, or the modification to the chromatin structure. This involves the histone modification as well as opening and closing of the chromatin. So as you can see here, if a region is being transcribed, it's usually devoid of all uh, most of the epigenetic marks, especially the repressive epigenetic marks. So the regions which have more DNA methylation and repressive histone marks 
are usually not transcribed and they are called epigenetically silenced. So DNA methylation is different in plants and animals. So basically DNA methylation is the met, uh, methyl group that is added on the uh, cytosine via met, uh, methyl transferase activity. And in most cases, like I mentioned, adding the CH3 on this uh, 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 makes the region transcriptionally inactive. I mentioned before there are three different methylation uh, context one is the CG, the other is the CHG, and the other and the third one is the CHH. As you can see, CG and CHG are symmetrical. So if you have one strand that has CG methylation, the other strand will also have methylation on the opposite CG. Similarly for CH, CHG, but not for CHH methylation. In humans and in mammals. DNA methylation usually happens only in the CG context, although recent work has shown that there is other methylation in CAG and CHH context, particularly in the brain tissues, as well as in the uh, uh, cultured uh, cell cultures of humans and other mammalian cell lines. Uh, but predominantly it has CG methylation that is maintained by uh, DNA methyl transferase, DNMT. But in plants, it's, it is uh, the methylation machinery has multiple enzymes. For example, MET1 uh, is a methyl transferase that methylates in the CG context. Chromomethyltransferase methylates in the CHG context, whereas uh, domains rearranged methyl transferase and CMT2 uh, methylates in the CHH context. So there is multiple layers of methylation in plants as opposed to mammals where it's predominantly uh, CG methylation. So then how is uh, having an epigenetic modification help in uh, plants in producing phenotypes? So earlier I talked to you about having a genetic mutation and how you can use this genetic mutation in crop improvement or in understanding the function of the gene. So you basically take this plant, cross it back to a wild type, and then sequence uh, the take the progenies in the F2, look at their phenotype, and then uh, sequence them to see where the mut mutation lies. So similarly, 200 years back, in this plant called Laneria vulgaris, this was the original phenotype of the flower. So all the flowers look like this. But Carlos Linnaeus, when he was observing these plants, he saw that there were some plants which showed um, uh, differences in the symmetry of the plant and the mutants look like this. He called the mutants Pyloria mutants. Pyloria means monster in Greek because he didn't understand why a plant uh, flowers within the same species were producing different um, uh, symmetry in the flower shape. So when people started looking at it uh, in the 18th century, they realized that the gene that is responsible for this phenotype, Cyclodia, didn't have any genetic change. So 200 years after the discovery of the mutant, uh, scientists from John Inn Center in UK, uh, Cuba Settle 1999, they showed that the mutant had, uh, did not have any genetic change, but it had changes in the DNA methylation on the gene so that the gene was transcriptionally silent. So because the gene was silenced by DNA methylation and not by any genetic change, uh, it gave rise to this uh, Pyloria mutant phenotype. So this is one of the first uh, known uh, epigenetic uh, changes that led to phenotype in plants. So after that, there has been multiple examples of epigenetic changes that leads to phenotypes in plants. For example, silencing of a promoter of the gene DFR in petunia gives flowers which has reduced purple color in them. Similarly, silencing of a gene, uh, chalcone synthase gene CHS, gives you yellow color seeds in Arabidopsis as opposed to the normal brown color seeds. And similarly, the uh, uh, mutations, parametation in the maize B1 locus gives you green uh, sheath color. And also silencing of the transposon at the SPM locus gives you purple spotted uh, kernels in maize. So these are all, again, changes in the DNA methylation uh, in the promoter of these genes or on the genes 
that give rise to stable phenotypes in these plants. So, uh, so these are some of the examples of how epi alleles are present in the uh, in the plant species and how we can use them uh, in plant breeding. So there are multiple roles of DNA methylation in plants. So what, what usually happens is DNA methylation silences a TE so that it does not disturb the expression of the neighboring gene. Uh, so also during re, uh, reproduction, uh, the DNA methylation goes down in, uh, some, uh, uh, in some nucleus uh, so that there is reprogramming of the methylation in, for the progeny. Also, there is cell type specific methylation. As you can see, some, some places where you have DNA methylation suppress the expression of the gene in a particular cell type or tissue, and in other tissues, maybe other genes are silenced because of DNA methylation in the promoter region. And one of the important aspects that most of the people are trying to look into now, uh, and one of my research interest is environmental interaction and stress. So if you think of a plant, and you put that plant under stress, the plant will show some DNA methylation changes. And if you take seeds from that plant into the next generation, and if you continue with the stress, you of course will have all the changes, all the DNA methylation changes there. But even if you put them under control conditions, some of the DNA methylation changes will still remain. So this will help in the for the progeny to remember the stress. And in the future, if the plant is exposed to stress, they can perform better uh, because of these DNA methylation changes. But recent research has also shown that these changes are not stable and they go back, they revert back to uh, unstressed state after just one generation without stress. So a lot of research is going on trying to see how uh, we can maintain this uh, epigenetic memory for longer uh, under induced stressful conditions for plants. So I use this in my PhD thesis to see how I can use the epigenetic variation in improving soybean. So I used a method to downregulate a gene uh, using RNAi transgene. And then when I put the gene back, then there, there should be no genetic modification. So then I'm just looking at if there is any other changes in the genome that is caused by removing this gene using RNAi. So if you think about this soybean plant, this is the wild type. And by introducing the RNAi transgene, I introduce some of the DNA methylation changes shown here in red. And after I remove this RNAi transgene, I still will have some DNA methylation changes in the, in the plants. So a subset of these epigenetic changes remain in this plants even after multiple generation after removing this RNAi transgene. So if I take this plant back and then cross it to a wild type, in the F1 generation, I will have one chromosome from the wild type parent and the other chromosome from the uh, epigenetically changed parent. And then in the F2, they will segregate for DNA methylation changes. And then I can select based on these changes and I can select a situation where I know this the DNA methylation changes will be more stable. And then I can use that in in plant breeding for important agronomic traits. So what I did was I selected some of these FF2s and then I grew them in the field as well as in the greenhouse. And as you can see, this is my wild type plant. This is where I started with. And I can get plants which produce 10 to 15% more number of pods per plant and number of seeds per plant. So this will help in increasing the yield of the plant from just the wild type plant. So I'm not making any, any genetic changes here. It's only by putting this RNAi and then removing it, I'm making the epigenetic changes which are stable enough to give me a phenotype. I grew these plants in multiple locations in multiple years, and I see that these plants perform better in whatever environment you put them in. So this is the wild type, it's producing uh, this many number of uh, kilograms per hectare in yield uh, under different uh, field conditions. And you can see these epi lines that I created which have stable DNA methylation changes, they perform better in all environments uh, that I tested. So this helps in um, breeding plants for multiple and different stressful environments and they can perform better using these 
uh, newly modified epigenetic changes. So this was my PhD research. And in my postdoc, I'm, I'm looking into how I can use this epigenomic data from crop wild relatives in improving stress adaptation in crops. So now I'm coming back again to maize and its wild relative. So you remember I told maize was domesticated in Mexico and similarly, uh, Tripsicum dactyloids, which is a wild relative of maize. Um, it was also domesticated in, in North America as well as some places in South America. But this plant, Tripsicum, was already colonized North America even before maize was domesticated and started uh, and people started growing them in North America. So these plants can grow in the harsh winters of North America and are better uh, uh, and better tolerated tolerate stress than these maize plants. So what I'm trying to do is trying to see how this close relative of maize can tolerate cold stress while maize cannot grow in the cold stress uh, seasons. So I'm using a nanopore and Illumina sequencing to build the genome for this uh, plant in collaboration with others in uh, uh, Department of, uh, in you know, uh, University of California, Davis, as well as Iowa State. And once we have the genome, we are also developing uh, DNA methylation for these plants as well as looking at chromatin accessibility using a technique called ATTACK-SEQ. And then we'll also look at uh, gene expression changes. So the idea is that if there are genes that are differentially expressed in these plants under cold stress conditions, and they are not uh, behaving similarly in maize, then we want to find out how these genes are different, differentially regulated between these two species. Remember, I told you these two are very closely related. So then this will help us in understanding how uh, these plants are tolerant to stress. And if we can transfer that traits into maize, then we can grow maize throughout the year in United States and then increase the production. So that is my uh, postdoc work uh, that I'm trying to introduce cold stress tolerance from wild relative Tripsicum dactyloids into modern maize using uh, genome assembly, uh, DNA methylation, chromatin accessibility, and gene expression data analysis. So in the last few minutes, uh, uh, Nishiji asked me to talk about how one can explore opportunities to get into agriculture biotechnology in United States. So, so the first thing that I would think is important is the preparation. So you have to know what is what interests you. Do you want to go into a university to do uh, research or do you want to go into university for uh, teaching or if you want to go to an industry and do the uh, and join the research team there so that is important to uh, differentiate and understand what you want to do and that will help you narrow down uh, how you want to um, uh, take steps towards your goals so the second important thing is to develop your skills so research skills the most important research skills for agriculture biotechnology currently is uh, the computational skills uh, using machine learning and quantitative genetics is evergreen field. So if you learn quantitative genetics or plant breeding, uh, you're always um, well sought after in the industries as well as in academics in US at least. And newly uh, plant phenomics is gaining a lot of attention. So learning how to uh, analyze uh, high throughput uh, phenomics data and also developing new tools to get these data is also getting very important. So when I talk about computational skills or uh, coding skills, you have to uh, have some knowledge about coding languages, at least one of the language, maybe Python or R. So there are multiple sources of places where you can gain this knowledge nowadays using either Coursera or EDX. And then the other important skill is writing skills. So uh, writing articles or writing applications is a very important part of the job uh, in agriculture biotechnology. So you have to improve your writing skills. Uh, the other important thing is to have a lot of networking. So you have to talk to people who are in the industry or join scientific societies so, uh, so that you improve your network through conferences and workshops 
and those can help you in finding jobs in both uh, academia as well as industry. So to improve your knowledge, uh, you have to keep up to date with the latest research in the field, uh, maybe use opportunities in the scientific societies to contribute to scientific blogs or write your own scientific blogs, uh, read extensively even outside your field and also explore um, uh, many other non-traditional career opportunities that are coming up like science policy or scientific communication or science communication. So these are the opportunities. And I also want uh, you to know that if anyone is interested in um, career in uh, academics or industry in US, and if you want any help, please feel free to contact me uh, about my research or uh, helping you with uh, getting jobs uh, in, in industry or academia. So thanks again for listening to my talk. Uh, thanks again for Nishiji for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, and if you and here are my contact details. Uh, if you want to contact me through Twitter, it's Sunil underscore Kumar KR, or you can email me at kenchanmane at uh, gmail.com. So thanks again. And with that, I'll be uh, stopping this presentation.